The Nazi claim that Germany had rockets which could bombard the United States was not far removed from actual achievement. Missiles capable of ranges up to 3,000 miles were in the design stage when Allied troops moved into Germany. The Vergeltungswaffe Swai, or retaliation rocket, commonly known as the V-2, had more than 12,000 persons engaged in the project in Germany, including 1,500 scientists, engineers and technicians, and 8,000 special workers. Many technical difficulties peculiar to the field of ballistics and aerodynamics were encountered in the early stages of V-2 development, but in designing, producing, and using it, the Germans proved themselves to be well in advance of any other nation. No discussion on guided missiles can fail to note the economic aspects of this type of warfare. A large number of these V-2 rockets, complete and unassembled, were recovered by the Allies at the close of the war, and a goodly percentage of these were brought to our own research centers. German rockets like these were rebuilt and modified at White Sands, New Mexico, where weather conditions for scientific research are ideal. With the speed of this rocket, the nearest approach to the speed of a meteor and its vertical range invading the spaces where northern lights waver and play their celestial game of tag, our research with data recording instruments and cameras will contribute much toward future developments deemed possible for mankind's penetration of the ionosphere. At the White Sands Proving Grounds, operated by the United States Army Ordnance Department in cooperation with the United States Air Force, the United States Navy and many of our foremost technical institutions, the V-2 in recent tests has reached an altitude of well over 100 miles. The engineering laboratories at Wright Field are playing an important part in this research. Recently, the Personal Equipment Laboratory developed a container installed with instruments and cameras to be ejected from the warhead of a V-2 at peak altitude and safely lowered to the ground by means of parachutes. The Wright Field Blossom projects have as objective the recovery of instruments and technical data from V-2 rockets by the employment of parachutes. Basic problems are the ejection of a container with instruments from the warhead and the design of parachutes to safely lower the container with data and photographic records for analysis. Here we see the installation tunnel in the warhead. An explosive charge. A safety timer. The container itself, the follower door, the motion picture camera, the two parachutes, data recording instruments, and the retaining plates, the brake cord snaps, and the parachute begins its earthward journey with the precious cargo. Preliminary tests of the parachutes and the containers were carried out by the Personal Equipment Laboratories at Wright Field. Parachutes able to cope with the problem of atmospheric changes must be constructed to assure a safe landing of the instruments. The container must be strong enough to withstand possible damage at the time of ejection, during downward flight of the parachutes, and at ground impact. The components of the tunnel and ejection devices are assembled by a technician who inserts an explosive charge into the mortar. The primers, which actuate 50 grains of slow-burning powder, are located in the firing chamber. Components of the mortar are built like a telescope. The end components are precision fitted against the follower door so that the explosive charge is constant. A ground wire is connected to the impulse generator. The ejection is accomplished by remote control under actual firing conditions. A spring-powered tensiometer occupies the center portion. Because of the possibility of excessive heat, a metal tape is used in the tensiometer to record the parachute shock forces. An arming switch, which actuates the installed instruments when the container is ejected, is inside the container. For test purposes, a temporary cover was placed on the container, but in the final assembly, the cover plate became part of the radar beacon assembly. Pressurization was maintained by sealing all possible openings. Container ejection tests were conducted by the parachute test unit 
using a special test tunnel. A spring separates the access door from the container. The door is held in place by retaining clips which shear on ejection. Preliminary testing of the container assembly is undertaken to determine the efficiency of the explosive charges. Results of this test prove the ejection devices were satisfactory. One minor defect was noted. The retaining tapes which held the follower door in the tunnel test were not strong enough. The outer rim of the container was damaged due to this malfunction. After a modification of the assemblies, equipment was again tested. Firing was done with a bazooka hand generator to conserve equipment. The explosive charge was sufficient to eject the container a distance, which is more than ample when employed at high altitudes. This test proved satisfactory. Running concurrently with laboratory tests on the container were parachute tests conducted to select the most suitable types. The objective was to develop a chute which would open slowly upon contact with the lower atmosphere as a sudden opening would tear the chute, rendering it useless. In the first parachute test at Alamogordo, a malfunction was experienced. Using a dummy weight to conserve the container, a drop was made from a B-29. A ribbon type hemispherical chute, 18 feet in diameter with dummy weight attached, proved a success. To simulate conditions of the V-2 rocket experimentation, the container and the parachute assemblies were mounted in the bomb bay of a B-29. Electrical contacts were run into the cabin control mechanism. In the third test, the container and parachute assemblies were successfully ejected at a height of 32,000 feet. Although results of the test proved that the parachutes were functioning properly, further modifications were necessary to make the lightweight aluminum container structurally sound. The parachute collapsed when the parachute housing separated. Malfunction was due to excessive use of the assemblies during previous ejection tests. Damage sustained by the parachute was of a minor nature, and the 18-foot canopy was relatively unharmed. The instrument compartment, separated from the parachute housing, was recovered six miles away from the chute. Thorough examination was made of the damage caused by a malfunction of the parachute swivel, so corrections could be made prior to future tests. The recording cameras, tensiometer, batteries, timer and impulse generator are given a final check. All components are in the firing position. The 18-foot canopy is carefully laid on the packing table. Each panel is folded in the proper position. The panels are meticulously placed to prevent a possible entanglement of the ribbons. The parachute will then open with a minimum of interference. The panels are folded once more to provide for the drawing on of the sleeve. Weights are used to hold the folds in place. Each side is equally spaced. The sleeve protects the parachute from possible tears and holds the ribbons in position. It also allows the pilot chute to draw the entire parachute assembly from the parachute housing. Lines of sufficient strength to withstand terrific pull and strain must be correctly arranged to eliminate possible entanglement. Here is the radar beacon, which is used to telemeter recordings of the tensiometer and to track the downward flight of the container and parachute by continuous signal transmission. This radar beacon was a development of the Watson Laboratory's Cambridge Field Station. The bottom cover plate serves as the antenna. Here is the parachute housing, the 16 millimeter camera, shock mounted, and the parachute riser which is attached directly to the tensiometer. The container is now ready for the packing of the parachutes. First, the main canopy is attached to the riser. The canopy is very carefully placed in with a minimum of twisting. Then the box type pilot chute is attached to the sleeve. Function of this pilot chute is to draw the sleeve and the main canopy from the container. A parachute release mechanism is placed between the drag chute and the main parachute. This device is actuated by an explosive charge which is located in a firing chamber on the bulkhead. When the charge is fired, the steel retaining arms are withdrawn, allowing the drag chute to come free. 
The explosive charge is fired at a predetermined time by an impulse generator and a mechanical timer. The drag parachute is attached to the parachute release device. This is a specially designed relay which is connected to the explosive charge. When actuated by remote control, it provides the means of ejection of the assemblies at the peak trajectory. The container, one half of which is packed with two chutes and a camera to photograph the functioning of the parachutes, and the other half a pressurized compartment housing data recording and signal instruments for tracking, is inserted in a tunnel in the warhead. An explosive charge in the tunnel's breech plate is set to eject the container 145 seconds after fuel shutoff. In the center, we can see the ejection mortar. Air relief vents eliminate the possibility of the creation of a vacuum upon ejection. This rocket, already declared obsolete as a weapon, with our modifications, now provides a new vehicle with which our scientists can explore the unknown, affording our upper air meteorologists a feast of research. For placing the missile in its launching attitude, one of the original German Mielerwagens is used. But for servicing the added research instruments and equipment at several stations in the body of the missile, Army Ordnance Engineers developed the Gantry Tower, approximating the framework of a five-story building on tracks. This device permits easy access for fueling installation, adjustment and checking of all control equipment and data recording instruments. Fuel in the German V2 consists of calcium permanganate, hydrogen peroxide, alcohol and liquid oxygen, eight tons of it. This develops a maximum thrust of 68,000 pounds for 60 seconds, giving the rocket a maximum speed of 5,000 feet per second. With all servicing complete, the massive steel tower rolls back and the rocket is ready for firing. From inside the massive concrete blockhouse, test engineers count off the seconds before the big lift. Radio controls and radar tracking devices function clearly and the flight of the missile is charted. Almost straight up into the ionosphere at a speed of 3,500 miles per hour. Then 145 seconds after fuel shutoff, the container is launched from the warhead. The movie camera and the parachute end of the container records the functioning of first the small brake chute and 165 seconds later, the cargo chute. The container is safely lowered and recovered. By contrast, note the condition of not only the warhead after it was recovered, but the tangled mess that was once the control device of the rocket. Upon inspection, the container sustained only minor damage. The parachute, none at all. The data recording and tracking instruments are found intact. The enthusiastic cooperation of landowners near the launching site resulted in speedy recovery of the parachute, the container, and the valuable instruments. <laughs>